This is Al Jazeera. It is 1500 hours GMT here on Al Jazeera. Hello, I'm Kemal Santa Maria. Welcome to the News Hour. Ukraine's president says his country will continue its path towards joining NATO as Germany's chancellor urges Russia to take up offers of dialogue. There are positive signs from Moscow as the foreign minister advises his president to continue along the diplomatic path. <laughs> Also in the news, Palestinians mourn the death of a teenager shot by Israeli forces during demonstrations in the occupied West Bank. And the Singapore Air Show shows off the latest technology, hoping to leave the pandemic turbulence behind. And in sport, for just the second time in franchise history, the LA Rams have their hands on the Super Bowl trophy. The Rams beating the Cincinnati Bengals to secure the NFL's biggest prize. So Germany's chancellor has met Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, and the latest diplomatic push by the West to avert this feared Russian invasion of Ukraine. Olaf Scholz says he expects clear steps towards de-escalation from Russia, and he is in fact off to Moscow to talk to Vladimir Putin on Tuesday. And Ukraine's president says despite pressure from the Kremlin, his country still seeks NATO membership. My as for our future alliances, our ambitions, you know very well that this is our wish. But apart from that, there is a war in the East, and we believe that NATO membership will ensure our security. We encourage Russia to use these offers of discussions. We emphasize again, in any case of military escalation, we have agreed with our allies and we are ready to undertake and implement very serious sanctions. The territorial integrity of Ukraine should not be violated, and if it does happen, we know exactly what to do. Now, Russia says it can see a way forward with the talks. Uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, though, is not satisfied with the responses from the EU and from NATO to Moscow's security concerns. All right, here is how we're going to do this this hour. Five correspondents right across this story. Step Vasen is in Belarus. Kimberly Halkett at the White House, Dorsa Jabari in Moscow, Dominic Kane in Berlin. But we're starting at the center of it all in Kiev with Natasha Butler. Tell us more about these talks there today. Yes, uh, talks between the German Chancellor and the Ukrainian President lasting more uh, than two hours. The leaders afterwards said that they were both uh, committed to uh, Ukraine's territorial sovereignty, that there could be no question over that. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, saying that when he goes to Moscow on Tuesday, he will be bringing a message to Vladimir Putin that any invasion or attack on Ukraine would be met with very strong and severe sanctions and all Western powers were united on that. Uh, the two leaders also said that they were committed to uh, continuing to work on trying to revive uh, a peace process for the east of the country uh, that has been ongoing so far with no major breakthroughs. It was interesting also that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, was asked about whether or not uh, Ukraine still wanted to be an, a NATO member. There had been some questions over that after some comments by Ukraine's uh, ambassador to London a little earlier in the day. Uh, Zelensky said that uh, Ukraine was still still very much uh, on the path uh, to NATO membership. It is something that is enshrined in the Ukrainian constitution, fundamental uh, to the Ukrainian government's principles. However, he seemed to suggest that perhaps uh, Ukraine being on that path, well, that could mean it might reach that NATO membership in the distant future. It might meet it sooner. We have no date for it uh, yet. But he said that they were still very much uh, committed to becoming part of the Western alliance in order to ensure uh, security for the country. Okay, Natasha Butler starting us off from uh, Kiev there. We move on to Berlin. Here's Dominic Kane now to talk more about Olaf Schulz's position as a, well, I mean, he's off to Moscow, so he's a, a, a would be peacemaker. What are the challenges for him? The challenges for him are very clear. They are that he is trying in some ways to be all things to all people. So when he's there with Volodymyr Zelensky in Kiev, he talks about friendship and the importance of the relationship between Berlin and Kiev. 
but he does not say that he's going to allow weapons to be sent from Germany to Kiev, which is the one thing we know that the president there really wants. We know also that he does not refer to Nord Stream 2, that really fundamental gas pipeline which mm. the Russians and Germans had agreed upon, which is now ready to be switched on, which could bring billions of dollars worth of gas to Western Europe and which is the subject of great concern. When he was asked very directly by a series of different reporters, that's all off shots, he would not touch on the subject, merely saying that the sanctions are ready, that they be, that the ink is has they've been inked as it were, and that he will be communicating that to President Putin in Moscow. But repeatedly, Mr. Schatz does not talk about Nord Stream 2 directly. Remember. This time last week, he was preparing to meet Joe Biden in the White House, the president there. And again, he didn't mention Nord Stream 2 directly. So it's a very delicate path that Mr. Schultz is trying to guide his country down and indeed to try to guide Europe down right now. He wants to help out, but he won't give weapons to Ukraine, which is the one thing they've said they really need. And when he goes to Moscow, let's be clear about this, he knows that his country depends to a large extent on Russian natural gas for much of its energy supply, as indeed does much of Western Europe. So when he talks about sanctions, saying there's going to be a really serious price to pay, but they're prepared to do it, well, the question is, how will he communicate that to President Putin in Moscow? OK, Dominic Kane is in Berlin for us. Thank you. Dulce Jabari in Moscow. I didn't know there was a longer diplomatic table to use in the Kremlin, but apparently Sergei Lavrov and Vladimir Putin found it for their discussion. What came out of that one? Well, it was very interesting because uh, this meeting was uh, obviously very much intended for a domestic as well as an international audience to show the conversation that was taking place between Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov, where the president asked the foreign minister what he thought about the U.S. and NATO response so far to the security guarantees that Russia wants. And the Russian foreign minister said that the U.S. response as well as NATO have been negative so far on the primary security concern that this country has, that is, of course, NATO's expansion. But Lavrov was still optimistic that diplomacy is not dead. The foreign minister appeared to leave the door open slightly, saying that the United States has proposed a series of security uh, issues that paved the way for further talks. He said that there is a chance to continue dialogue and discussions. And when Vladimir Putin asked Sergei Lavrov, do you think there's a chance for an agreement on the security topic, on the main topic, uh, Sergei Lavrov responded by saying there is always a chance. I think this was a very public way of trying to de-escalate the current tensions that have been continuing. And the president also met following uh, his meeting with Lavrov, also met with the defense minister, Sergei Shoigo. And mm -hmm. He also was briefed about the ongoing uh, military drills. The defense minister said some of those are coming to an end. Uh, others are wrapping up. And he didn't specify what will happen to the troops that have been deployed in the certain parts of the country. But clearly, the message from the Kremlin today and from Vladimir Putin that this country is still willing to continue these talks and that diplomacy is certainly not dead. OK, maybe some positive signs coming out there. Thank you, Dorsa Jabari in Moscow. Now to the North Lawn of the White House. House we go. Kimberly Halkett, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, has been invited to Ukraine uh, pretty much as soon as possible by the Ukrainian president. Has there been any response to that? I feel it might be a little awkward at the moment, given Joe Biden's telling people to get out of Ukraine. Well, there, there certainly hasn't been a response so far. In fact, the readout of that call by the White House didn't even mention it, which is notable. What we know is that on the president's schedule has just been added a phone call, uh, and it is not with the leader of Ukraine, but instead with the UK leader, Boris Johnson. We know that at 1730 GMT, the US president will be speaking on the phone with the UK leader as he continues to coordinate 
coordinate with transatlantic leaders, projecting unity in terms of the coordinated response should Russia invade Ukraine. And with respect to that invitation by the President Zelensky, well, uh, we will have to ask in the upcoming press briefing if that is something that the U.S. President will entertain. Now, he's been at Camp David over the weekend. He's set to return to the White House South Lawn very shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a White House that is continuing to ramp up warnings that at any time Russia could invade Ukraine. In fact, uh, this is something that the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has been saying for weeks. Uh, the latest warnings will be issued to members of Congress on Capitol Hill. He will be briefing members of the House of Representatives this morning here in Washington. And then later on, he will be briefing members of the U.S. Senate. So we're watching carefully to see what more the White House might have to say about that invitation by the Ukrainian leader. But so far, very little. That is our White House correspondent, Kimberly Halkett. Thank you, Kimberly. Finally, Step Varsan, who is in Pinsk. This is on the border, Belarus-Ukraine border. What have you been seeing there today with regards to, I guess, any military action or, or, or drills that have been ongoing? Well, it was very interesting uh, today. We've traveled to several areas where the Belarusian authorities say these joint drills with Russia are ongoing. We went to one location nearby where uh, S-400 uh, missile defense systems and Sukhoi fighter jets were uh, reportedly being transported to from Russia. But in interestingly, it was really calm. It was very different than the scene we saw a couple of days ago when we saw much more military activity. We saw like uh, gun, uh, gun uh, helicopter gunships uh, going through the air, doing uh, all kinds of practices. But today we hardly saw any real serious military exercise ongoing. Uh, we all, uh, we, what we did see was uh, military transports on the road still. So a lot of trucks going from one side of the country to the other, especially here at the border with uh, Ukraine. Uh, and as the Dorsa said, it's um, Minister Shoigu, uh, the Minister of Defense uh, from Russia. That's a shame, isn't it? Just lost our link with Step Varsen there, just as a... Uh, uh, you know what? I see her back. Step, do you want to just pick up where you left off? I think we've got you back. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, as Dorsa said, uh, Shoigu, the Minister of Defense in uh, Russia, said that these exercises were sort of uh, coming to an end and some were already finished, which is interesting because officially they're only wrapping up, up on February 20 and there's a big uh, press tour organized uh, on Saturday the 19th. So it's not clear if that means that the exercises will stop even before then. And also today, Alexander Lukashenko, the leader here in Belarus, was asked what will happen to these uh, Russian troops. Uh, uh, NATO thinks there are around 30,000 Russian uh, forces here in Belarus right now. Mm. And uh, Lukashenko said, well, that's our business uh, mm. with uh, Putin and I will meet him soon and uh, make sure that I'll deal with this. Interesting stuff. Step Varsen in Belarus rounding out some tremendous team coverage here on the news uh, across the Russia-Ukraine story. We are almost 13 minutes past this news hour. Here's what else is coming up. A new place